rather than spending thousands of dollars on your rent, well, we've invited Greg Dill, commercial mortgage strategist, here to help us talk about a unique and proven strategy that he's developed that can get you the financing you need to get the offers accepted. Greg, welcome to Critical Mass Radio Show and Podcast. Thanks for having me, Rick. It's good to have you here. Let's start, before we get into the wonky stuff, let's talk about lending and stuff. Let's talk about you. Do sure. you have an interesting story that you can share with our audience? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, like probably a lot of people, I took a securitous route to my, my profession. A okay. lot of people, you know, they, they don't go to school they, they what, for exactly what they're going to be doing, obviously. And, and I didn't go to school to focus on being a lender, although I did have some finance background. I've done a lot of things in my life. After undergrad, I went and worked in investment banking and then briefly in, in the commercial real estate space, but on the capital market side. From there, going back to grad school, I took a completely different route and got my degree in engineering. So I worked what? worked more on the logistics and supply chain, and that actually took me out of the country for about six years. So I was in Europe, in Latin America, Asia, Africa. And during that time, I actually transitioned from engineering to advertising and journalism. So I did a lot of sales on the international front. And when I came back to the U.S., I knew that I wanted to be in a business development role, help uh, serve people and uh -huh. help them with, with their financing and to get them into uh, buildings. Okay, so Greg Dell, before we get to all that, you got I got to back you up. You have an sure. advanced degree in engineering? In engineering, correct. In operational engineering, so supply chain management and logistics. So, <laughs> you know, I think you have to be a chameleon in this in this world now. There's a uh -huh. lot of things. I always say, I don't know what I'm going to do next. Granted, since I moved back to the U.S. in 2010, I've been doing the, the same thing and focusing on my market. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, when I came here, it, it actually made me sweat to sign up for a con contract for my cell phone and uh, you know now I now I have a home and I, I don't think I'm going to be moving anytime soon okay um, what is it about this area of financing that got you interested I mean wh what's what is the intellectual stimulation because you strike me as sure. the kind of guy that needs to be curious about what you're doing because you've done a bunch of things that are really unrelated it sounds sure. like so yeah, I mean, I think the the big thing is that I'm working with business owners every single day, and every business is different. I I just hired a, a new transaction coordinator, and she's learning the ropes, and every time she says, well, that's different. There's something different with this. And I'm like, yeah, everything is different, which is good. So you get to learn about the businesses, and you get to learn about the whole finance side. So it's, it's actually helping people. I, I always say it's almost like... The, the American dream is to own a home, but the American yes. business dream is to own your own building. And so I am helping someone fulfill their American business dream. Well, that's uh, I, um, I accept that premise because I work with a number of business owners as well. And the ones who uh, have purchased their building, especially if they purchased it around the Great Recession or sure, shortly sure. after that, they're thinking they're pretty smart. Yeah. Because yeah. their asset base is so low, and now that's an appreciating True. asset. Plus, it's, it looks like to me, if you buy the building, uh, you can rent it to yourself, and ultimately you can have a hard asset that whether the business continues Correct. forward or not, you've got something that's uh, maybe generational yeah. wealth here in Southern California. No, that, that's definitely true. How I look at it is, it's it, one, it's a forced savings plan for, for a business owner. They, they're going to they're gonna have to lease a, a building anyway, yeah. so why not, I always say I help people stop paying rent. Is, is it really true that they stop paying rent? Well, they're stopping paying rent to a landlord, but right. what, they are, what they're doing is they're investing in their future, so they're, every month they're, they're gaining equity on one paying it down uh, the amortization plus hopefully in the long run in, in increasing the value of the of the building and so once they decide to to retire they can sell the business and keep the building they can sell the building and the business so there's a lot of options that they can do if they do think about it uh, ahead of time and get into uh, their their own commercial real estate well this is really interesting and i do have a set of questions ladies and gentlemen i'm going to ask greg dill about but i'm i'm just kind of going off the top of my head because in our peer group meeting this morning one of the things that we were talking about is when is the right time for a business owner to decide to sell their business and there were a lot of stories about waiting too long sure. or selling at the wrong time illness or whatever mm -hmm. and then the the value of the business can go down very quickly sure so that's a no matter how successful your business is it can become at risk and it can lose a lot of its value the beauty of owning a building is in addition to the business you've got this hard asset Correct. that in m many times is going to weather the storm better than maybe your business that, will. that's true and and i use i use a story that uh, just last year i helped out a a CPA firm acquired, two, two guys left their firms, they acquired another business that was run by four CPAs. The, the 
business had been running for at least 20 years. They sold it for a good amount. It was about 1.6 million. But once Uncle Tan- Sam takes half of that, right. they're at 800,000 each, right? Within four people, that's about $200,000 for, and that's of 10 years of work. So they got an extra 10 grand every year. If they would have bought their building at that point, they didn't own their building. If they would have bought that 20 years ago or 30 years ago, they would have had a, a nice payday. Right. Okay. So, so I, hopefully we've got your interest now because what you said, Greg, about the American dream of buying your house, uh, it, it never, I thought of, never thought of it that way, although I'm a big fan of business owners buying their building. The idea that it, the American dream for a small business owner, and we have many of them that are listening to the radio show, is to look at the building or sure. a building and figure out how do you become your own landlord. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, definitely. So, so who do you help? What's your, you know, on the show we like to say, what's your... What's the niche that you really sure. are successful in? Well, um, you know, my niche is working with business owners. So what what they call in the industry owner occupied commercial real estate. So some people will go in and they'll they'll buy a strip mall and obviously they'll have tenants and they'll be they'll be getting rent every every month about that. What my goal is to help the actual business owners buy their own building. And they use it through a a main program, which is my niche, is called SBA financing. So SBA financing, I I always always liken it to FHA, but Uh for business owners. A lot of people know in the the residential world, FHA gets you into your home at 3%, 5%, very low down payment. Well, it's similar to that, but for business owners. So there's a a government program that's uh, bipartisan. It it actually doesn't come out of any of our our funds for for taxes. It's it's paid through uh, similar to how they do with FHA financing. But then a business owner can actually acquire their their own building for as little as 10% down. Mm -hmm. Usually, if you're going the conventional route, that's going to be at least 25%. So I always give an example of if you have a million dollar building that you're going to buy, it's a lot easier to to save up $100,000 than it is to save up a quarter million dollars because that differential, you're going to want to use it for your business, right? There's working capital needs, and it's a a little easier play if if you're focusing on a 10% than you are 25 or more. So what my experience having done the show for a while is that whenever I have someone in who understands a government program, especially a federal government program, there's kind of a lot that you have to learn to be able to navigate that process. Is that true for this SBA lending? I mean, yeah. it's not the average bearer who spends the time to learn and navigate successfully sure. how a lender, you know, how the lender operates. Yeah, definitely. It's it's definitely a niche market. What happens with that? I mean, even within within my my bank, my own bank. So I work at a bank. I always say I work at a bank. I'm not a banker. I'm a commercial mortgage strategist. So how I really help out businesses is looking at it as a holistic approach. So I'll look at this type of transaction if it fits the 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 needs of the client and it fits in the the rubric of what's going to be for SBA financing. We'll usually take that route because of the reasons that that I said, uh-huh. but. We do have to do have to learn new changes. I mean, they happen every single year with changes about that, and and some of them are are very very minute. That if you don't have the right explanation, or you try to go down that path and it's it's the wrong wrong route, you're not going to be able to get financing. So that's it. Always pays to work with someone that's an expert in the field I and that so. can really really look at the transaction before you get to that 45th day of your financing contingency when your money actually goes non refundable. Okay, so. Um Tell me, what is it that you're demonstrating it based on how we're having this conversation, but what makes you unique and in this space? Because I would imagine there might be at least one or two other people in Orange County, Southern California, who focus on this niche as well. Sure, sure. I mean, what, what I always think about is I want to make sure that everything works out from, from the get-go. So a lot of lenders, what they're going to do, they're going to quote rate. They're going to quote rate right off the bat. They don't know anything about the project. They don't know anything about the business, and they definitely don't know anything about the client. I will not do that until I'm actually fully, fully, con- uh, fully understand that everything's going to work for them in okay. this particular transaction. I always say that I have a plan B in place. If I can't do something with with at my at my lender, I make sure that I put the client in the in the right direction. That might be in the right direction of a competitor that they already ha- already been working with. If I think that they've got the a great deal, I'm going to tell them to take that deal. So I think a lot of mm. other lenders don't look at it in that way, and they don't do their homework work up front. So you've all, everyone's heard of a, a pre-qualification letter. So my my idea of a pre-qualification letter, Rick, is you receiving a letter in the mail from a credit card company saying, you've been pre-qualified. <laughs> That's about it. They right. found your name. Right. The, the second step be, before you can get actually qualified and, and approved by underwriting, which in that point, you actually have to have a, a signed contract, is what someone will call a pre-qualification, or excuse me, a pre-approval. Yes. Well, pre-approval, they've done a little bit more homework. They might have got some of the finances, 
But if you could believe it or not, on the commercial side, most banks cannot run someone's credit or they don't run someone's credit up front until you get into underwriting. Well, hmm. when you're in underwriting, you're, you've already have a contract in place. Right. So that's one part. The second part is most banks don't get proof of funds up front. So they haven't really vetted that you have the money to hmm. put down plus the money for working capital plus your personal funds to live on. So I do all of that up front, but the th third key factor is that I run a cash flow analysis, and this is gonna mimic what my underwriters are looking at, exactly to the penny of what they're gonna look at and if it really qualifies on a financial basis. So that probably gets back to more of my engineering and finance That's background. What exactly what I, I really thinking. need to yeah. look at that before I'm willing to put my name on something, and most of the commercial real estate brokers that I work with and, and a lot of the, the CPAs and different people that are within my strategic partner group know that if they see my name on something I've really done my job vetting it because okay. I don't want to I don't want the other side to see something come come uh, the next transaction and say did Greg really do his homework on this or is he just right. trying to give someone uh, a deal so they can get into contract I, I don't want to waste anyone's time the client the brokers my time the seller anyone involved in the transaction so in Southern California you service Southern California I do. Well, I service Southern California, mostly where more of my most of my transactions are going to be in Orange County and in the Empire. Okay. I also work in in Los Angeles and and San Diego. Typically, where I can drive to if I really need to. Right. But I can work along the coast where my my bank will work from California, Oregon, and Washington. Oh. Sometimes in Arizona, sometimes in Nevada, sometimes in in Texas. But what I also have is affiliates. So like I said, if I look at something and it doesn't work for me, whether it be geographic, whether it be strength of a transaction, type of a product, I do have outlets to help that client in that in if I need to go to that plan B. Okay. So um, a couple questions again off script. Is there a lot of inventory available to purchase in those? More, in, let's stay in Southern California. There, there, there's really not. And, and it seems to be the, you know, the, the song of the day, but... The song of the day has been going on for five, six years. It's, right. it's getting tighter and tighter. Most of the owner-occupied space, which I see, is in the industrial market, and mm -hmm. they're getting away with a lot of the industri industrial uh, pieces around here in Orange County. Yeah, they can move a little bit out in the Inland Empire, but now it's uh, in terms of actually having a build there. But mm -hmm. I was even talking to a commercial real estate broker up in Portland this morning, and he says that it's almost no different than what it is what it is here. As soon there. as something comes on the market, there's multiple offers. So what I want to make sure is if I vetted a, a, a buyer up front, vetted the client of that they're going to make an offer, I make it as close to a cash offer as possible by saying we've done all this homework. We can get in and actually close this transaction. So my pre, what I call a field underwrite approval is about a five-page document that outlines exactly what we do. It shows it shows that we've done, run credit. It shows their proof of funds, and then it's the then it'll be the typical type of pre-qualification or pre-approval letter within there, and then some of the credentials and the steps that we've taken to put our name on something and stand behind it. So you, the parallels with the, the housing market are uncanny here as we're talking yeah. about because you know you, you mentioned a cash offer. Are there outside investors who are coming with all cash buying commercial buildings there, in, there, in this There's market definitely, well? yeah, there's definitely all cash offers. So, and, it, and it's not necessarily just investors doing it. It's There's business owners. Okay. There's a, there was a lot of foreign money coming in as well. Um, at, and so, yeah, I, I can't compete with a cash offer. Yeah, I can't. I can't give a can't get financing on cash. So it, that doesn't really do much for me. Right. But obviously, if you can, usually cash offers are going to be lower than what what a, a seller oh, okay. is actually okay. listing. So if you can convince them to go with your client because you've done a thorough job, they're probably willing to wait that forty five or sixty days of the escrow period mm -hmm. to make sure that uh, they're going to get a, a You're higher. You're taking a risk off price. the table for them. Correct. Okay. Correct. Because it. If you got the cash, that deal's going to go through. Yes. Right. Yeah. Where, that that's true. Okay. That's, well, in theory, in they, theory, right? They can make a cash offer, right. but that doesn't mean that they that they're not going to get financing. They could still negotiate a certain amount of contingency period and an escrow period, and then actually be looking at the financing. So I always let the you know, let the clients know that, and let the brokers know that as well. That you know, just because they're they're making a cash offer doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to go. Because there's a lot of horse trading at at the end there, and mm -hmm. and you don't want to get in that either. So we're talking with Greg Dill. He is 
an expert in this area and has seems to have a great passion for it, which is which is pretty obvious. Um, I w- I like to switch gears just a little bit here on Critical Mass Radio Show. Unintended Consequences, my latest book, Killing Cats Leads to Rats, all about unintended consequences of strategic business decisions. Have you had an instance where you had an unintended consequence from a decision? And can you share one if you can think of it? Yeah, I mean, I I think. One, one thing I, I mentioned to you about competition. So w- when I talk to strategic partners, referral sources, you know, normally commercial real estate brokers that are introducing to them, me to their client, a lot of what I hear all the time is they already have a lender. They work with a bank. I understand that every business owner is going to yeah. hopefully have a bank account, yeah, hopefully think. have a banker that they work with. And But that doesn't necessarily mean that that banker is looking out for them. That doesn't mean that they're actually going to be able to do their transaction. So what, what I've found out in, in in just the years I've been doing the business is if I can help someone out, I'm going to make sure that I help them out. If mm-hmm. it's me directly, if I have to go to that plan B and, and use some of my some of my other affiliates, but also if it's competition and they have a great deal, I'm going to actually let them know to go mm-hmm. forward with that. I might tell them the pros and cons, but if they're just looking at this one aspect of it, I'm not going to lose my my relationship with a referral source, with my strategic partner over one transaction. And I think when you show that you care to the actual end user, the business owner, he might start to think, well, well this what's this, this guy's a little different here. What's what's he? Why is he telling me to go with the competition? Well, right. because maybe in that instance, it, it is the best thing for them to do. But the next time they're going to remember me and say, this guy was frank, he was upfront, he was honest, and I'm going to want to work with him in the future. Yeah, it's so rare to have somebody suggest you go to a competitor or consider another product or service. I mean, that does cause people to take notice, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I say I have to sleep at night. You know, there's, there's a couple things I believe in, and, and uh, you know, one is what I call deal karma, and that's... <laughs> Take a take the phone call from someone. Help them out. You don't know you don't know if you're going to be able to help them now or in the future. But if you treat them right, it'll come back to you. Maybe not in that transaction, but maybe in another right. one. I agree and with that. and the other is just basically doing the right thing is always the right thing. So if <laughs> it's sort of like you know if you if you, you know, if, if you don't lie, you're not going to have to remember what the truth was, Tell right? So it, it's right. it's just making sure that you're you're always doing the right thing for for your client, for the, your strategic partner, for yourself. Okay, but you you're focus is really helping people get qualified through the SBA and the programs that the SBA is offering. SBA is, the, is a niche market. So I, I can okay. do conventional financing as well. Right. Uh, but SBA for business owners, usually when they're purchasing their, their first building or, or even multiple buildings, because it's it's not unique to the one bu- one building. They can actually do multiple buildings with that. That is my, my focus because that's the easiest way for business owners to take advantage of acquiring a building at very low down payments. Right. And, and are they uh, so what would be, if someone's listening out there and they're going, well, you know, I don't know if I could qualify for an SBA or I to, maybe I think it's like a big hassle or something. What's the right kind of person that you find that you think you should be in an SBA program? Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. well, definitely. I mean, it's it's someone obviously that that wants to own their own building okay. they're, they're in, in, or should. And, and most business owners, like we talked about earlier, probably should own sure. their own building, yeah. right? They've, they've probably been in business for anywhere from three to five years. So we require that we're looking at their last three years of tax returns. Okay. So it's their business and personal tax returns if they have other investor type tax, tax returns. But there's there's two parts. There's a standalone, which would be the business and how that looks financially. And then we call the, the global, which includes the the income that's coming for, for them individually. So And you're we, looking at all that to assess their ability to make the payments? Ability the to risk? make the payment exactly. Well a okay. little bit of both. So what they're doing is they, they've been they've been leasing for a number of years now. Well that lease when it's going to come up they can transfer that, and that's going to now be their mortgage payment. So we call it a, a rent replacement. Mm-hmm. So they've been renting uh, you know, X amount uh, for, for however many years. We're looking at their monthly payment, and then we'll net that from whatever their mortgage payment is going to be to make sure that they, they still qualify on their coverage ratios and their mm-hmm. and their cash flow. Okay. And and working with the SBA, you have obviously know how to get that done. I, you know, I think sometimes when I talk to small business owners, those three initials, SBA, sound like, oh, that's a lot of work, or I don't know if I, it's a, you know. True. True, true. Yeah, I mean, when I when I give talks, I, I that's how I start out. I, who's heard of the SBA? Who's heard it's a you know, <laughs> it's a headache? Well, I think it used to be, and it does okay. it does matter who you work with. Okay. I all when another client, or excuse me, when a client's working with someone else, and I ask, oh, I'm I'm already working with the SBA. It's been this. Well, let me. I ask them who that is because if they're doing a good job, I probably know who that person is. Okay, and it does matter because if we're out there trying to help business owners, I always say that. 
they should really be focusing on their business, not focusing on filling out paperwork, not focusing on on uh, signing documentation. Yeah, they're going to have to do that at the end, but I want to take all that off of their plate, work with their C- CPAs and their accountants, get their tax returns on that side so they don't have to focus on that. My goal is to put everything together for them and have them review and sign. Hmm. So uh, it seems to me uh, interest rates are going up. Does that make a difference to you and what you're doing? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it does. There's, okay. there's a, you know, the interest rates have been very low right. for the last number of years. Right. They're we're, still historically low. But we're spoiled. But yeah, exactly. But also, obviously, interest rates have gone up, and so have values of property. Yeah, so it's like a double whammy. It's a double whammy, exactly. So I think you know a lot of people are going to be priced out until maybe some of these, some of the val- some of the properties are going to be listing in, at, at lower prices. Okay. So you know every every quarter point, every half point, every every point of an interest rate is going to have that many less people not being able to qualify. Okay. Because that's going to obviously bump up their whatever their monthly mortgage payment's going to be and and with some of the ratios that we're looking at, they they may not be able to make the cut. But one thing that I I find from working with small business owners, most of the time they're in the business with their on their taxes of tax minimization. So they're trying not to show a profit. And a lot of times I'm working with them during their during their uh, extension period on their tax returns. And we have to find out a way to show that they actually are making more more than they are. And what does that happen? A lot of it has to do with some of the expenses that they're putting through or at the timing that they're doing it. Right, timing. So yeah. a lot of times is I like to say that my favorite answer is yes. The best is a quick no and, and an alternative to help you out. Okay. That no might be no now, but yes if. Yes if we do this. Yes if we work with your CPA. And sometimes I'm working with clients over a number of years, two, three, four years, before they can actually get in that in their oh, wow. building. But I'll take a consultative approach to that and talk, talk to them every quarter to see where they are with their finances and, and how much they've saved up. But then also where they're going to be once they file their tax returns. And I always have their CPA send me their tax returns to make sure everything pencils out before they file them if they want to do uh, right. actually want to acquire a building within that year. So, so is the triggering event oh your lease is coming up I should think about buying it or is it like my lease is coming up I think I sh- I should consider alternatives to releasing this building maybe I could go buy something somewhere and and do is, is that usually the triggering event for the client their lease is about to expire, and so they have yeah. options now. It can be, yeah. That okay. that can definitely be, especially when they've you know, number of years ago, like you said, they they've got in at uh, at great prices, whether they bought the building or they actually were leasing. And now, when it comes to the market, leases might be twenty, thirty, fifty percent more. Right. So then they start scratching their head, saying, well, "Holy heck, hey, <laughs> yeah, I should def- definitely think about it because it's it's not that." Prices of properties are going up and lease lease rates are going down. No, so they, it's definitely one of the times that they should they should all should think about that. But they shouldn't think about it a month before. They should they, they should be thinking about this a year or two ahead of time. Right. Like I said, to make sure that everything pencils and that it works out from their tax returns. There's really no downside to having a plan to be able to buy a property as a business owner. It, it, I mean, it takes a little bit of your time, but you're willing to help the qualified kind of people think for the future. Right? It, this is the kind of thing you yeah. don't want to do at the last minute either. No, you, you, you definitely don't need that pressure. What with leases is well and, and typically you have to you have to renew your lease and, and start talking about it within six months every commercial real estate broker is going to want to make sure that he has you talking uh, he, he has you talking with him so he can talk with the landlord within yeah. that time because if you can't come to an agreement and you need to move you oh. don't want to be put to the put to the coals right at the right. end there I, I love the fact that you've in my mind made it you've cemented this concept if you're a business owner and you have a house and you own at least one house if not a rental property you ought to consider about buying the house for your business as well because it's the the benefits seem to be similar to what they are if you can swing it to buying a home definitely definitely okay so hopefully we've created some interested uh business owners who may want to uh buy a building in the future which i think is awesome it's good for everybody to own property i think there's no real downside to this is there what am i well, missing I, I i think in the long run obviously if, if they're in, words, yeah if, long if, they're, run. if they're in for it to try to it's like a, someone buying a house if they're in there to flip the house oh. and you get it you get at the wrong point <laughs> yeah it, it, can, it can be detrimental yeah. but if you are in there for the long run you're gonna your business is going to be going on for a number of years that's your plan right uh, 
you know, sort of like the stock market. You keep investing in it. You you don't look at the blips up or the blips down. You go for for the long haul. And after 20, 30 years, you've actually owned this property. Now you can you can utilize it as your as your retirement plan. Exactly. So, Greg Dill, if someone would like to contact you to learn more about this whole concept of a commercial mar- uh, mortgage strategist, how do they find you? Where where should they go online? Well, online it's it's probably best to just look me up on LinkedIn. If you look up Greg Dill and the how do you SBA, spell that? It's G R E G. Okay. D-S- and David I L L, and you can look up Greg Dill and the SBA lender. I'm sure you'll find it. It'll also probably be on, on Rick's uh, website as yes. well. And yes. uh, you know, feel free to give me a call or send me an email anytime. Love to help everyone. Well, thank you for your time and, and a very illuminating conversation. In 20 minutes, we covered a lot of ground. Yeah, thank definitely. You. Thank you very much. I, I enjoyed it. Thanks for being a friend of the program and a part of the critical mass community, Greg Dill. You're very welcome. Okay, thanks, thanks for having me. That you're welcome. Thanks, Paul Roberts, for your help in engineering this program, and for our three producers, without whom we cannot do the show. They are Joan Park, Crystal Nunley, and Haley Stern. If you'd like to connect with me, let's start on LinkedIn. I'm Richard Franzi, F R A N Z I. And until our next show, I hope all of your business decisions will move your company in a positive direction. You have been.